Yes, sir. Well, it's good to have all of you with us tonight. If you'll take your Bible, turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Father, I pray now that you'd bless your holy word as it goes forth, Lord. I'm simply the sower. Our Father, we pray now that you'd anoint it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Luke said things which are most surely believed among us. Now, this is, uh, this is a declaration that these people believed very, very strongly, very uh, surely they believed with utmost confidence in their faith. In the book of Acts chapter 1, he said, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to the apostles whom he'd chosen. And now watch this. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. The apostle Luke is not playing games. And he says that these things he most surely believed. I'm going to give you some things tonight that I believe, and I hope that you do, and I hope that you uh, are in agreement with, uh, with, uh, with these things that I give you, because what I'm going to give you tonight are the things that I have, I have been settled in after a long time in ministry, studying the Bible, prayer, and seeking God's will and wisdom in understanding the Word of God. Uh, there's an awful lot of six-month wonders out there. One year wonders, they've been saved six months or a year, and they've already mastered the Bible. I get questions from them like that, and they give me a long uh, list, uh, litany there of all the things that they've, that they've learned and so forth, as if to say that they have mastered the subject. They've only begun. Amen. Only begun. Amen. Only begun. Believe me tonight, folks. They've only begun. Now, when it comes to the inspiration of the Scriptures... I believe the Bible is God's inspired word, inerrant. I really do. I believe it is. I believe I've got a book I can hold in my hand right here, the authorized version, 1611, that is without error. This is infallible. And if you do not believe that the Bible is without error and infallible, then you're on a slippery slope. And that slope may take you somewhere that you may not want to go. The uh, proliferation of translations of the Bible today has led to a situation to now where they have no respect for the Bible whatsoever. And I was reading an article in New York Times by Sopin Deb, April 17, 2017. Here's what the article says, New York Times. What if it really was Adam and Steve? That's what the Outfront Theater co Company in Atlanta, which stages shows created only by people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or questioning will set out to answer for audiences during a three-week run of the most fabulous story ever told starting April 27. Remember that title, The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told. The work is an alternate version and comedic send-up of stories from the Old Testament. Now, they would have never done this 50 or 60 years ago. And the reason is because people respected the Bible. Even those who never read it, they respected it. But today, the Bible is, uh, is open completely for anyone to disrespect and, uh, and, and, and interpret any way they please. And one of the things that laid the groundwork for that is all these multiplicity of translations. And all of them purporting to be a clearer, more accurate, more up-to-date, more contemporary understanding of the Scripture. So what's happened is that the unsaved world has latched on to that philosophy and they've come along and said, well, so, all right, if you can do it, we can do it. And so don't try to condemn us for our lifestyle. We'll take the Bible, make it say whatever we please, and that's what happens. Uh, I've been reading this book a long time, folks. 
I sat in a classroom for three years and learned Greek grammar, two years and learned Hebrew grammar, and I took this, take this book right here, lay it down next to anybody's lexicon, and I have not found any mistakes in the Bible. Amen. They're not in here. Not in this book, this King James Bible. I couldn't have said that when I'd been saved six months or a year because I didn't know anything about that. But uh, this is 40 years of it, and I see the fruit of it. And the fruit of it is a nonchalant, cavalier, laid-back attitude that the church has today to God's Word. They don't believe it's inspired. They don't respect it. And since they don't respect it, they don't believe it's inspired, they don't preach it. They don't believe it, and there's no power. The only Bible that I've ever had in my hands in the years that I've been saved that ever gave me power was the King James Bible. There's power in that book. There's power in it. But in any event, the... Uh, I get a lot of emails from people about the Bible, about the King James Bible, and you'd be surprised at how many people are coming out of apostate churches, coming out of New Age churches, coming out of uh, the occult world, and they're being drawn to the King James Bible for some reason, don't you think? Here's a letter from New Zealand. Dear Pastor Lawson, New Zealand, the other side of the world, dated 2 April 2017. My wife... Audrey and I are so thankful to Almighty God for His grace and mercy and that He blessed you and comforted you as you recovered from the procedure you had to you, that you had to endure. Of course, we've been thankful for all that He's done for you, and we continue to pray for you, your family, and for your church family. Even though we are many, many miles away from your church, Temple Baptist Church is our church now. We have departed from the apostate church that we used to attend, and at long last we have a pastor who preaches, teaches from the King James. We receive all your services via live stream. That's who carries us now. That's our content provider for which we give thanks to Temple. The sermon that you preached on the 26th of March, A Message on Hell, was truly magnificent, just what we needed at the time, so we thank you again for the sermon. More importantly, we thank the Holy Spirit for leading you to preach it. One last thing. We love the song, What is Wrong with the Old King James Bible, sung by that lovely lady who sings from her heart with so much love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that her name is Mac Miss McLeod, but please accept my apologies if I've got it wrong. They got it right. So the people in New Zealand enjoyed your song. Pardon? Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. Now, that's what I believe about the Scriptures. I believe the Scriptures are inspired. I don't have any time for people who want to correct my Bible, pick it to death, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and destroy my faith in the Word of God. I firmly stand on this book that I preach. This is why when I preach it the way I preach it, I preach it because I believe it. I believe it. I believe the book. The second thing is, I want to talk to you about the Godhead tonight. Listen to this email. Dear Pastor Lawson, greetings in Jesus. I listened to your sermon on YouTube on the grace of God, in which you briefly speak on the Holy Trinity. You said that you believed in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but did not say whether this means they are three distinct persons in the one Godhead, now listen carefully, or modes of the one God. I could not find anything on this on your website. Blessings in our Lord, best wishes. And this is coming from a real believer. And this is, a, this is an inquiry into what I believe about the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Notice the word modes, M-O-D-E-S. That's from modalism. What's that? That's the teaching that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost are all one person. And that... Uh, when the reference is made to God the Father or God the Holy Spirit, it's referring to an office of the Trinity, but not a distinct identity of someone in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Folks, I have studied Servetus. I've gone back into the eternal sonship of Christ. I've read this stuff and prayed over this stuff and gone over it for years and years and years, believe me. And I've done a lot of work into it, and I've done a lot of praying about it. And I am firmly convinced tonight that the Godhead is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But let me read something for you tonight. This is the, um, this is the Greek English lexicon of the New Testament and early Christian literature, third edition, 
in parenthesis, B-D-A-G. Any Bible college student will know exactly what I'm referring to. Revised and edited by Frederick William Danker, D-A-N-K-E-R. It's German in its original format. It's been published by the University of Chicago Press, Chicago and London. This is on Hebrews chapter number 1, verse 3. You've heard me quote it to you many times. Listen to this carefully, what I'm reading to you. Hebrews 1, 3. Hypostasis. This is their definition of it. This is straight from their Greek lexicon. The essential or basic structure, nation, nature of an entity, substantial nature, <coughs> essence, actual being, reality. Now that's a general definition of what the word means. Let's take the word in the context of Hebrews 1, 3. All right. Let's read Hebrews 1, 3 in your King James Bible. Did you know that some of the old witnesses for Christ used Hebrews chapter number 1 to prove the deity of Christ more than any other passage in the New Testament? They took them right where I'm taking you. This is one of the most profound statements in the New Testament as to the deity of Christ. Now in 1 Timothy 3.16 it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, who was manifest in the flesh. The New Bible say he who. See, he who was manifest in the flesh, that means anything. That means nothing. But in the King James, in 1 Timothy 3.16, it says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of God in us. God was manifest in the flesh. That is a powerful statement as to the deity of Christ, right? Now look what you're going to read here in Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, are you getting the sense that the Son and the Father are a little different here? Yes. All right, continue on. Look at verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, let's stop there for just a moment. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the Son. All right, the Son is the brightness of his glory. You remember I did a thing on that when that light came on Mary and impregnated her. You remember that? The light that came into the temple and all of that. Who being the brightness of his glory. Now watch this. This is the statement. And the express image of his person. The King James translators had to get a word to translate hypostasis. This is what it says in Greek. Character, taste, hypostaseos, alta. These are the very Greek words that this text is translated from. Now listen to what uh, BDAG says about this. Here's the definition. An exact representation of God's real being. Now how do you understand that? A representation of God's real being. King James translators use the word person. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very presence and essence and manifestation of God. That's what it's saying. But he is not God the Father. He is the light flowing from the Father. Look at the text carefully. Verse 2. Verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person. What is an image? An image is a representation of another or of one. So what is it saying? It is saying this. It is saying that the mystery of the Godhead, which will be revealed in the book of Revelation, when it says the mystery of God will be revealed, the mystery of the Godhead will remain a mystery until the Son shows you the Father and the Father shows you the Son. But as far as the Godhead is concerned, God the Father is an individual. God the Son is an individual. And God the Holy Ghost is an individual. Each one of them are individuals that make up the one Godhead. They are not offices. They are, it's, modalism is completely off course. It's completely missed it. It is the mystery of that eternal, almighty, uh, 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 
absolute invisible being. For a human being to be so arrogant, and boy do we get arrogant, as to think that we can bring him down and put him under a microscope and dissect him and explain every part of the Godhead to our satisfaction is, is the height of folly. I believe in a God tonight that is so much greater than me that my mind can hardly grasp. I believe in one tonight who is almighty, El Shaddai, eternal, from everlasting to everlasting God. And to get arrogant about it and to start stomping around and, 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 and saying, that oh, I've got God all figured out. No, you don't have him figured out. You don't have him figured out. And then to, and then to take God the Father and, and, and essentially just eliminate him and to say that the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And every other appearance of the Father of the Holy Spirit is the Son himself appearing as that. That's what they're teaching. That's what they're teaching. That's what Jesus only teaches. That's as far off course as it can possibly be. When Christ was hanging on the cross, he cried out into the heavens, into the darkness of the night, and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't saying, my office, my office, my office, where did you go? No. In the book of Hebrews, look at this one right over here. Look at this text, Hebrews chapter number four. I'm only going to give you tonight these passages that are so powerful. I mean, these are powerful statements. Hebrews five, verse number seven. Hebrews five, seven, who in the days of his flesh... We're talking about Christ. When he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto the office that was able to save him from death. <laughs> and was heard, the office heard him in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. Obedience to who? And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He was heard. He was able to save him, the one that was able to save him from death. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the son crying out to the father. That's who he's talking about. How do I understand the father? I'll never understand the father till the son takes me to the father. <laughs> and nobody else will. The Bible says no man knows the son but the father. No man knows the father but the son. And as I've said to you so many times before, and I may be wrong, I may be, I may be, I may be wrong in eternity. We'll find out if I'm right or wrong. But I don't think anything has ever laid eyes on the Father but the Son yeah. in His pure essence. Yeah. Nothing. 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 But the Son. Amen. He's the only one who knows the Father and knows where He is and that can take you to the Father. Yeah. That's the Son. And yeah. He can. He can. He left him, came back to him. He'll leave him and come back to him again. The son of God. So I believe, I believe in the Godhead. I believe in the Godhead. I believe in the fall of man. Man is a fallen creature in need of salvation. Only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this statement right here. Listen carefully. This is by a very wise person. If you don't use somebody else's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own. Listen to this thinking. Listen to this. For too many years now, at least 50, the modern church has made the main focus of its teaching on the love of God, but failed to deal with the justice of God. As a result, we have two major results. The church is now adopting the universalistic assumption that because God loves us all, we are all saved without consequence for sin. See what they've done? They've taken it over the cliff. And secondly, the word justice, which became hollow over this period as a recognition of its role of restoration through condemnation and redemption, has been hijacked by the loons <laughs> to mean creating equality for all. That's what the word justice means now. A trophy for everyone. And anything less requires the intervention of a social justice warrior 
to make all equal and just. That's the kind of preaching they're getting. This is a friend's comment from a recent shack post of mine. One of the best and most discerning comments I've heard in some time. God bless you. And I just got this today. And it is a very discerning statement. Can you see the discernment? Can you see how the human mind can be led alone, led along, and then fed and fed and fed piecemeal, piecemeal, until the words change their meaning? And now when you get up and preach to people and use scriptural terms and scriptural words, they don't mean the same thing to them anymore. It's semantics. So you have to read what's done. They've redefined everything. And so you have to learn how to minister to your generation. And I've been doing that now for some time. Pray God show me how to minister to the generation in 2017. I have to know what terminology to use. I have to know where to speak. I have to know what to say to them. I have to know how to reach them. Because, folks, if they're not being reached, the love of God has been so perverted and distorted that God's arms embraces everything from pedophilia to bestiality to, to, to the occult world, human sacrifice. makes no difference. God loves all. You ever heard this statement? God is love and love is God. You ever heard that? That is the end of the perversion. I was listening to a man yesterday who's smart, very smart man. He was talking about the occult world. He came out of it. I always like to get a first-hand account. He was talking about how that in the occult world that the, the gurus, the big ones, the guys, the, the people who reach the top say that they come into the presence of a being of love, that they sense such wonderful love. It's just beyond explanation that they sense this great love, and yet they are witches and Satanists. You follow me tonight? So you may see a being of light, and you may feel great love, but that being of light may be an angel of, it may be, a, it may be Satan is opposing as an angel of light. You got to be careful of all of these deathbed experiences. Some are genuine, some are not. You got to be careful with that stuff. You can't just jump on the bandwagon and because it sounds good and it fits what you think it ought to fit, it's okay. Got to be careful. And let me warn you again tonight. This is 2017. You are watching a tsunami of the occult world through the church and through every avenue you can imagine. I preached a message the other day and just barely scratched the surface. The many roads to Lucifer or the many paths to Lucifer. It is overwhelming at what's coming down the road and it's coming right straight at you. And you need to be prepared, especially those of you that have little children. Because your little children are going to be, if the Lord doesn't come back soon, they are going to be living in a world that you don't even recognize. You will not recognize it 10 years from now. You won't recognize it. That's how bad it is and how quickly it's changing. So, we have a statement here. A certain person sent me a thing and he said this. You said a certain group that worshiped different were saved. I find the only way a person is saved is believing the five fundamentals of the faith. Okay? The virgin birth. He was accused of a false crime. He was God in the flesh. He died on a cruel cross for total payment for all sin. He was buried in the grave, was there three days, three nights, crucified on Thursday, the day before Passover, was there Thursday night, Friday, and so forth and so on. And then uh, he, he, res he was resurrected on Sunday morning. If they will confess that nothing but the works of the Lord Jesus Christ will save them, that what they do has no effect on salvation, then I will accept them as brothers and sisters. If they enter any form of self-work into their salvation, then I have a problem with their salvation, and most of the religions today are working themselves to hell. His premise on the surface of it is pretty good. But the point is not what you believe. The point is the person you have. Amen. Salvation is a person. Amen. You can take Catholics and sit down and look at their catechism. And you'll be amazed at how much of their catechism you're going to believe point after point. That does not make you saved. He that hath the Son hath life. 
You can be so ignorant of the scripture that you wouldn't know the difference between Malachi and Matthew. But if you know you're a sinner and you know Jesus is the Savior and you're willing to receive him into your heart and take him and pull him in and say, Lord Jesus, I don't know anything and don't, I don't, I, I, I'm ignorant, but I know I'm lost and I want you in my soul. Save me, Lord Jesus. Would he save you? Of course he would. Of course he would. That's salvation. I've been to the altar too many times with pre people that have wept, prayed the sinner's prayer, lasted a week or two, and out the door and never darkened a church door again. Sinner's prayers don't save you. Roads in the Bible don't save you. They can be a tool to be used, but they don't save you. When you receive the person, and that is the New Testament pistuo, that is that pistuo, that is that faith, that is all embracing faith, that is saying, Lord Jesus, I got no hope anywhere, nobody, anything. You are going to be my Savior. Lord Jesus, I'm a dirty, rotten, low down, stinking sinner. I deserve to go to hell a thousand times over. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Would he save you? Of course he would. He'll save you. Salvation is a person. Salvation is a person. Person. Now, election. And I'll hurry through these because I know we could spend all night talking about this. Election. There's a big controversy about election. you got five, like who was the brother said Sunday night, all of the Calvinists are, are, are always one of the elect. <laughs> yeah, they are. They are. It's, 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 like, it's like abortion. All abortionists were people that were born. Have you ever met an abortionist that wasn't born? <laughs> that somebody else aborted? See, that, it may sound comical, but the bottom line is, you talk about a selfish crowd, a selfish, self-loving crowd. It's that crowd that's alive and were allowed to be born and allowed to live, yet they want to kill. Yeah, buddy. Got your number. I understand that. Sure. And so the five-point Calvinist... The five-point Calvinist is always one who considers he or him, himself or herself to be the elect. Well, here are the three elections in the Bible. There's the elect nation. That's Israel. There's the elect people. That's the church of God. Then there's the elect angels. If election always has to do with salvation, how do you figure the elect angels? Doesn't fit, does it? How many times have you heard a preacher get up and tell you that angels can't be saved, that God didn't die for angels? Well, you all have. You've heard it a thousand times. Well, what are the elect angels for then? Election in the Bible is like angels in the Bible. It's not a simple thing. It can get very complicated. But here's the point about election. Here's the point about election. I don't deny it for a moment. Ephesians 1 makes it plain. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Ever last one of you in this house tonight, if you're born again, you were elected. But there's not one verse in that Bible and my phone is still silent, and I'm still waiting. There's not one verse in that Bible that says only the elect will be saved. Think about that. Think about it. If God chooses to elect, he certainly does. And he'll elect his bride, and he certainly has. But election is not as simple as people want to make it sound. Let's say, for example, I'm a five-point Calvinist. All right. Tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, predestination. I bought the whole thing. Let's say that's what I am tonight. I'm a, I'm a five-point Calvinist. Do you know what I really believe inside my soul? I believe, really believe inside my soul, I believe inside my soul that certain babies were conceived, born, live out their lives, and die, and burn in hell, and they never had an opportunity, never would have an opportunity. They were predestined before they were ever conceived to be nothing in the world but something to burn in the pit. That's all, they were, that's all their existence was about. They had no choice. They were, they were chosen to burn in the pit because they were predestined. If you're predestined for heaven, then you're predestined for hell. Can't have it both ways. If you've only got the elect that are going to be predestined for heaven, then you have the elect that are predestined for hell. Right? And there's a deacon on line, and he says that our babies are in hell. I said, how young? Oh, in diapers. 
So you have diapers, got babies in diapers, burning in hell and screaming in hell. Can you imagine if that were you? Now let me ask you a simple question tonight. What kind of glory does that give God? What kind of glory does that give to God? Think about that for a moment. That's Moloch, brother. You got that right. That's a good observation. That's Moloch. That's the God, Moloch. They used to put their babies in his arms and they'd beat the drums and the babies would roll down into the fire and the little things would be screaming, burning alive, and they're out there beating their drums to this pagan piece of garbage called Moloch. What kind of God's that? What kind of a God is that? Do I deserve to be saved tonight? I lived for 27 years out here in hell. 27 years in hell. And then the voice of God came to me and called me out of the pit and convicted me and drew me by his Holy Ghost. And I got on my knees and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And it all changed just like that. I don't deserve to be saved tonight. My goodness, did God see something in me when he convicted me and drew me by his spirit? Am I, am I more worthy than some little six-month-old baby that's in hell? But did you know, friend, that these people that believe in baptismal regeneration for infant baptism and all of that, that there's an awful lot of them out there that believe that babies aren't, that aren't baptized are going to hell? I don't want anything to do with their God. Nothing. I have no more to do with that God than I do the Allah. That they're blowing people up. That's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Suffer the little children, forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom. Except you be as a little child. Little children. At the little children. Little children. Little children. But that's the problem you get into with five point hyper Calvinism. That's what you get into. So what do you believe, preacher? I believe that even those that he died for, Peter said, would deny him. Do you hear that? Peter said, denying the Lord that bought them. Now, if he only bought limited atonement, if he only bought the elect, then we have the elect that are denying the one that bought them. That's what Peter said. That's a tough one, isn't it? The writer of Hebrews said that by the grace of God, he should taste death for God was in Christ reconciling the, he would have all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. Yes, sir. He's a savior of all men, Paul said in Timothy, especially those that believe. There's one name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Christ died for all, all sin, all sinners, all I believe in the autonomy of the local church. I believe the church of God is a called out assembly to be led by the people to choose their leaders, not by a hierarchy that exercises authority and control over local assemblies. I believe that healing is in the atonement, just like salvation is in the atonement. Let me ask you a question tonight. Somebody said, I don't believe it's in the atonement because so-and-so wasn't healed. Is salvation in the atonement? How many so-and-sos do you know that haven't been saved? You follow me? He died on the cross for everybody, but is everybody saved? But the potential for them to be saved is there. They can be born again. He died for all men, just like healing is in the atonement. But is everybody healed? No, they're not healed. But the healing was paid for on the cross at Calvary. There's a lot of different reasons why people aren't saved, and there's a lot of different reasons why everybody's not healed. But it's there. It's available, and Christ died for it. I believe in a literal hell and a literal heaven. I believe in a literal hell and a literal heaven. Here's a man that wrote a letter from North Carolina, and he said, your sermon on hell has changed my life. He said, I was already saved, but now I have a much higher sensitivity to sin and the unfruitful things we involve ourselves in in this passing world. He says... He gives a reference here to a YouTube video that you can watch. And I clicked on it, and folks had used, uh, they'd made a video that lasted about an hour. They used the testimony of a man that had gone to hell 
died and saw hell and then came back and got saved. And they used some of the preaching that I'd done in here. And, uh, and they made this video. And so this person sent me the link to it. And they, this person had watched that video. And it, uh, and it got them right with God. I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. The YouTube, God has blessed. God has blessed YouTube beyond my wildest imagination. I never imagined for a moment that when YouTube started that it would reach the kind of people it's reaching. Folks, there's a, there's a thing on there called Sermon Audio. All right? Then you've got our website. Then you've got YouTube. And people are hungry. They're logging in and they're watching. They are hungry. They're looking for something. They're everywhere. They're all over the place. And they're trying to find something for their soul. Amen. Last Sunday morning, uh, Van Caldwell said he did a survey of the church in here about how many people we had. We had one of the biggest crowds we've had. You know I never talk about numbers. I don't talk about numbers. But the reason I'm going to talk about tonight is in context of what I'm talking about. I don't talk about numbers. It's not about numbers. You see, you see any numbers on the wall back there? No, no. I'm not interested in numbers. But this house was packed Sunday morning because it was Easter. He said he just guessed something like maybe 375 people in here. But do you know how many people was watching us live at the same time on the Internet? More than that. More than that. More than that. It's God blessing this ministry, reaching out to people. Thank God for that. That's what I'm here for. That's what I finish my race for. That's what I'm called to do. That's what's left for me for the rest of my days on this earth. It is the ministry. And when God gets done with me in the ministry, I'm going to be done with this place. It's that simple. I'm finished with it. I have no desire. I have no desire to go somewhere and retire and hang, hang up my Bible and go out here somewhere and sit in the woods or sit on the bank and fish the rest of my life or just wander around here or go, go somewhere and eat breakfast and talk with the boys for two or three hours every morning or something like that. No desire. Have none. Have none, folks. I'm happier than I could ever be. This is, this is the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life is what I'm doing right now. I can't express to you tonight what a blessing it is for a 70 year old man to be, to be at the end, to be at the, I don't know how much time I got left, but to be where I am in life. Most people, when they're 70 years old, they're looking, they're looking toward, forward to retirement, you see. Not me. I am, I am blessed, fulfilled, happy, satisfied, because I am right smack where I'm supposed to be, and I know it, and God's confirmed it to me. And I could never have imagined 30 or 40 years ago that when I got to this age that my life could be so filled and so blessed. I could be so happy. I could be so, so full of the joy of God doing exactly what God wants me to do. I've got a Bible. <laughs> like Obama said, I got a pen and I got a what? What's he, what did he say he had? He's got a pen and a what? Phone. Obama said, I've got a pen and I've got a phone. In other words, I'm going to do my, my executive orders and get my agenda done. Well, you keep your pen and phone. I got a Bible. Amen. Obama's gone. Book's still here. Yeah. Presidents come, presidents go. Book's still here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm blessed tonight. I can't explain to you tonight how much blessed I am. I am blessed because I got a reason for living. I have. I have got a reason for living. <laughs> I know, brother. What's the point? I mean, if it's, fa it's fatalism, that's fatalism. Hyper-Calvinism is pure fatalism. In other words, it's going to happen. What's going to happen is going to happen. That's right. Forget it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. What's the point in giving an altar call? What's the point in trying to reach people? That's, uh, I got no use for hyper-Calvinism. I despise it. I do. I mean, that's one of the things down through the years. I, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I've seen all kinds of problems with people. You wouldn't believe the problems people have, the homes that I go into. My goodness, folks, the families and the way they could start coming apart and the things that are happening in the families. And how in the world are you going to minister to people if you, well, you may not be one of the elect. And what am I going to waste my time here for? 
I mean, really, if I'm going to be a, a hyper Calvinist, I need to be able to plug into the elect to the elect button and be able to ask God, are they one of the elect? I'm not going to waste my time if they're not. You know, you're going to, that's the only way to minister if you're going to be a hyper Calvinist. You have to have this sensitivity about you where you know the ele who the elect are. Isn't that a joke? Isn't that a joke? For whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. No, he doesn't, brother. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't believe it now. No, they didn't, brother. Oh, no, they didn't. And they try to teach that the Baptists are a product of Anabaptism, not necessarily. No, no doubt a lot of Anabaptists were what we are today as Baptists. But no, sir, the Baptists were around long before the Anabaptists were ever around. Oh, yeah. People may not have been called Baptist, but people have been here for 2,000 years that believe what we believe. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. I'm not a, I'm not a Baptist brighter, but no doubt in my mind that we have had for 2,000 years people that believe. You believe the Bible, don't you? What make, what, where in the world this garbage come from that Baptists showed up, you know, and during the Reformation? They were a product of the, of the Reform. No, 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 no. Reformers came out, of the, uh, came out of the Catholic Church, folks. That's what we're talking about, the Reformation. And that's what they say out here. They try to teach people that, well, all these Protestants were former Catholics, see, and they were and, and they were, and revolting against Catholics. No, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. And I agree with those brethren who say that Baptists are not Protestants. I agree with that. And the reason I say that is because the Baptist Church did not come as a product of the Protestant Reformation. Amen. People that believe what you believe have been here for 2,000 years. Amen. Amen. And one last thing, I'll shut up. A few months ago, I made a statement about the flat earth. I was talking about the, the uh, Lake Michigan up there, you know. I only threw that out there to make you think. There's nothing wrong with making you check what you believe. Now, I've had folks come to the church here, and I had one lady out there in the foyer, she jumped all over me and she said, now, preacher, it's time for you to get on board here. We've got a flat earth. And I'm, <laughs> and she, she was a good woman, no doubt. I believe there's an awful lot of good people, brethren, they love the Lord. I'm not up here to vilify anybody, but folks, I do not believe in a flat earth. I do not. I do not. I do not. I believe according to the scripture, the Bible says a circle of the earth in the book of Isaiah. I believe that the, uh, the, uh, Christian astronauts that have been up, Christians, folks, these are men that love the yeah. Lord, have come back and talked about the beauty of this globe sitting out here in space, this round earth. Yeah. No, I do not believe in a flat earth. I, I just can't accept that. The Bible won't. Well, yeah, I know. If, why would the earth be flat and all the rest of them round? That's what your point is there. The moon's round, all the rest of them round. But... Uh, I, I can't accept the flat earth, but I'm not, I'm not up here to vilify my brethren because there's a lot of good people out there, and they do believe that, and they've done a lot of work, written a lot of books, a lot of tapes, and all of that, and then some of them are out there trying to say that uh, Preacher Lawson is a flat earther. I am not a flat earther. <laughs> I am not a flat earther. Amen. All right. I'm done. <laughs> all right. Do you have any prayer requests tonight?